So welcome to everybody. I'm uh, extremely happy to, to open this uh, uh, webinar uh, on the renewed partnership with the Southern Neighborhood and the implications for Israel. Uh, my name is Dan Katarivas. I am the uh, uh, chairman of the Israeli EU Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which is uh, actually the umbrella chamber of all the bilateral chambers of Israel with European or actually uh, European countries as part of the Union. Uh, we just actually uh, suspended the uh, the British Chamber, but we still have them as an observer. So, uh, uh, and we have, uh, we don't have all the chambers that are present in Israel, but uh, most of the country do have a representation. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that uh, we've been waiting for quite a while to see uh, how the EU will actually uh, uh, renew its uh, uh, action in the region. Uh, the region is changing itself. I think that uh, uh, certainly in the last few months, Israel positioning in the region has, has gone through tremendous, I would say, changes. Uh, and it's, I'm sure that uh, the speaker that we have today will address that. Uh, because uh, if we were, I mean, an island, we are now part of uh, both the West, I mean, the Eastern Mediterranean, where things are happening there. And also, I would say, we are part of the Middle East with what's happening with the Abram Accord. So I think the positioning of Israel is extremely interesting nowadays. We belong now to, and we are connected uh, to, to things that were not there before. I think that Europe also uh, uh, has uh, undergone uh, changes. Well, the Brexit is certainly one, but the COVID is also something that has shaken things inside Europe. But I think that the Europeans are now putting their, their home back, uh, the house back together. And this is interesting. And definitely the relation uh, that with this region, which goes back many, many years ago, uh, I mean, not to mention the Barcelona, but even before the Barcelona process, I think that the, uh, the vocation of, of Europe vis-à-vis -vis the Mediterranean or the Mera Nostrum is something that uh, definitely exists. So here now we have a new document, a new agenda uh, that uh, we would like to look into that. And for that reason, we brought uh, 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 several people, uh, but uh, we are actually having this uh, uh, webinar together with uh, Nimit uh, Vim, and in a minute, uh, Nimrod Goren, the founder and the head of Madrid, will address us, and with uh, uh, Miki Drill, who is uh, uh, from the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung of Israel, and with uh, also uh, Maya Sion, who is now the chairman of the uh, Israel uh, Association for European Integration. So we have uh, here, uh, I would say, a, a partnership that can look at uh, this process, and, uh, and I hope that uh, we will all... Uh, uh, I would say, uh, leave this uh, one hour and a half with a bit more information and, and more ideas how to, uh, uh, to carry both the partnership of um, Israel with the, the region, how to uh, 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 move the relation with Europe, and how to look at all this process in a very uh, positive manner. So without further ado, uh, Nimrod, Dr. Nimrod Goren, please, I uh, pass you the, uh, 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 the microphone and... Uh, and for your opening remarks. Please, uh, Nimrod. Thank you, Danny. Uh, it's a pleasure to cooperate with all these uh, institutions that you mentioned. Uh, we've been working together for some, quite some time and uh, having a chance for an opening chapter with the EU and its southern neighborhood is a good uh, opportunity to, to reconvene. And I thank you all of the audience that joined us today. My name is Nimrod, I'm heading with Vim. Vim is a foreign policy think tank based in Israel, celebrating its 10th anniversary this month uh, working to better integrate Israel into its surrounding regions, including the Mediterranean, Europe, and the Middle East, while working to advance Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking and improving Israel's foreign policy. And we have to remember that we are convening today at a very difficult day for Israeli-Palestinian relations, for Jewish-Arab relations here in Israel, in Jerusalem, maybe also in Gaza. And these are days that raise questions on which international actors can intervene, can moderate, can mediate, can help uh, actors on the ground live in a better a reality in a more secure and safe environment. And when we are looking into the international community, definitely countries in Europe, uh, the EU itself, countries in the Mediterranean, the southern neighborhood, have been playing a role in the past in mediating Israeli-Palestinian relations and perhaps could play a role now. Uh, but on the ground, you do not see that happening now. Uh, and the weakness of uh, the EU and the region in intervening in Israeli-Palestinian affairs is evident. And therefore today, when we are discussing what this renewed partnership could mean, uh, I will also think about it in the prospects of uh, com contributing to peacemaking uh, in our region and to regional stability. Uh, it's not only about what's happening today. We are also marking one year since the establishment of 
an Israeli government that will no longer perhaps be in existence in a couple of weeks from now. But one of the things that this government did manage to do is to change the tone uh, from Israel towards Brussels. It was actually a role played by the foreign minister Ashkenazi, not by all uh, government members, but it did create a better language, better atmosphere, better engagement on the political level, on the diplomatic level between Israel and Europe. It was also a year in which developments happened between Israel and the southern neighborhood, where there is a consolidation of the Eastern Mediterranean gas flow that transformed itself into uh, an international institution. Uh, the linkages between the Gulf and the East Med and Europe. Uh, negotiations between Israel and Lebanon, which was you know, just resumed recently. Prospects of perhaps ambassadors going back to Tel Aviv and Ankara. So a lot of diplomatic development and engagement that are happening and are setting the tone for perhaps a new chapter with new uh, government in place in Israel, with a new foreign minister perhaps, with a new Israeli ambassador to Brussels coming up soon, with a new uh, European ambassador to Israel in September, with a new EU special representative to the peace process, and with a new paper by the EU about how to engage with the southern neighborhood. So we're um, excited to learn what does that all mean for Israel, what new opportunities it opens up, how could we best leverage the changing regional landscape, the changing political landscape, in order to utilize these new policies coming from Brussels towards a better region for Israel, for its neighbors, and for the people of Europe. So thank you all again, and I'm giving the mic back to you, uh, Danny. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nimon. Uh, I think, yes, I mean, we are, today is a, is a difficult day. I haven't listened to the news uh, uh, all day, but uh, I hope that things will calm down and uh, but, uh, we are all definitely watching what's happening in Jerusalem, hopefully uh, not uh, having repercussions which are beyond uh, or too, too important, but we'll see that by this evening or tomorrow. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker will be uh, Mickey Dwill from uh, the Friedrich Eber Stiftung. Please, Mickey, uh, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everybody. As some of you <clears throat> may know FS Israel is actively engaged in advancing Israeli European relations and promote regular policy dialogues between the EU and Israel. From our point of view, one of the strategic targets of the FAS work in Israel is strengthening Israeli-European alliances and disseminating information about the EU in Israel and vice versa. This is very important since uh, Israeli-European relations are complex and uh, ambivalent. What we try to do is introducing European viewpoints into the Israeli discourse and Israeli viewpoints into the European one. We facilitate exchanges of decision makers and experts. We do so in cooperation with our partners like the Israeli Association for the Study of European Integration, represented here by its co-president, Dr. Maya Sion Tzitkiyau, and MITVIM, the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies, represented here by its head and founder, Dr. Nimrod Goren. At this occasion, I would like to thank both of you, Maya and Nimrod, for our strong and long-lasting cooperation. I would also like to emphasize our good cooperation with uh, Dani Katariva for the past uh, two decades. Dani, I'm glad that we partner uh, this event with the EU-Israeli Chamber of Commerce. Usually, in normal times, I mean before Corona, we hold the events like this one at leading universities and academic colleges in Israel with the aim to bring distinguished lecturer guests from abroad and assemble discussion panels around the guests with leading Israeli lecturers and prominent figures specialized in European affairs. Now we are forced to do so by Zoom, which also has its, its advantages like assembling people from all over the world. I'm really happy that we uh, do have so many participants from so many institutions and countries with us today. Without any doubt, this fact is also due to the important and interesting topic we are discussing uh, today and due to all the distinguished speakers. So thank you everybody, Michele, Luigi and Noah for being with us. We all are looking forward to listen to your contributions and I wish us all an exciting and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Miki. So actually, uh, let me explain uh, to you how things are going to, uh, to, to, to be conducted. We have four, uh, actually, uh, uh, four distinguished speakers. 
uh, each of them will actually have uh, eight minutes to actually uh, uh, tell about uh, his view of this uh, new uh, uh, southern neighborhood and its implications for Israel. Uh, after each of those uh, speakers will, will, will make his, uh, his uh, presentation, we obviously will open it to, uh, to question and answer. You all know, I presume by now, that you have down the, uh, uh, the, the way of, of chat of actually uh, putting a question. And actually, we will try also, uh, if you put your question, to identify you among the, per among the, the, the gallery and to let you even ask the question directly uh, without actually uh, reading it. So we'll see how it will manage. So please don't hesitate to ask uh, all the questions and the most pertinent one. Uh, and again, uh, we are recording this meeting. So I hope there is no problem. If someone doesn't want to uh, be recorded, just let us know in advance so we can actually shut down the recording. But I think that uh, uh, we are not, uh, I hope that everybody is okay with the recording. So I'm just saying that. And obviously uh, uh, I think that we can now start uh, by having our first uh, speaker with uh, Michele Melroni, who is a policy officer uh, uh, of relation with Israel at the European External Action Service. So Michele, the floor is yours, please. Eight minutes, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a minute before the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Catarivas. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me, for being uh, here. Uh, so let me start. Um, joining the wish that uh, the situation in uh, Jerusalem uh, diffuses uh, soon and that these clashes uh, come to an end very soon. Um, I have prepared a sort of a, um, let's say, very rough presentation or just a, a list of bullet points uh, for you uh, just to accompany me through my intervention, which will last, I hope, less than um, eight minutes. I think that the question and answer part will be very interesting. So I am now trying to, um, to share my screen. So uh, first, I think it's important to um, set a little bit the stage for, uh, of the um, position of Israel um, and Israel-EU cooperation in the South Mediterranean. So uh, you all know that there is a strong technical and economic cooperation between Israel and the EU. EU is the first uh, trade partner of Israel, Israel is the second or third trade partner of uh, EU. And I think that if we count investment, it uh, goes to um, position number one. Um, but Israel is uh, already engaged in regional programs. So um, as far as EU cooperation in the South Med is concerned, Israel is not say, uh, insulated, but it already participates in some uh, regional programs on climate, on environment, on transport. And uh, if we uh, talk trade again, um, this, uh, this year, uh, at the end of this year, we should see uh, the um, implementation of the new rules of the um, Pan-Euro-Mediterranean rules of origin. Um, this is just an example of uh, um, an, an, uh, an, an initiative uh, and uh, rules of origin are very important for trade uh, that would let's say, help the uh, further integration of uh, um, Israel and the entire South Med region. Um, regional integration, intra-regional integration and integration with the EU. Uh, so these new rules should um, should come into force at the end of the year, at least for the countries that will um, that will complete the uh, procedure for adoption. Um, then also a quick reference to this uh, new partnership. Why now? Uh, you are 25 years from the Barcelona process, from the declaration. We not all um, of this declaration. I mean, we have not lived up to all the expectations. Um, we are still a problem in the area, um, in the region with uh, even conflicts and uh, um, economic development uh, um, is not the same everywhere. Israel, um, as Israel economy has developed very well, but this, uh, the same cannot be see, uh, said for all the economies in the region. And then we are faced with the huge challenges. I mean, climate change, COVID-19, I think we all know uh, how difficult those challenges are to face. Um, the objectives of the new agenda, um, I would um, focus your, I would like to bring your attention uh, to 
green and digital transition that are uh, really at the core of the uh, overall strategy of the Commission for the next uh, years, and uh, also the will to use all EU, um, all the tools that are disposal of the EU, um, and at disposal uh, of member states uh, to support uh, cooperation um, we, um, with the South partners in the South Mediterranean. So uh, there is this um, intention to use all that it is at the disposal and new instruments in a more strategic way, in a more comprehensive way. And member states are, um, and there is a strong coordination between the EU and member states in the, prog in the programming phase, and there will be a stronger uh, coordination in the implementation phase. Sorry. Yeah. So the main themes, um, voila. So, the main themes are, are, are five, and it's, it's a broad agenda. It's um, broader from the last document uh, on the region, which was the um, European Neighborhood Policy Review of 2015. Uh, we have added a focus on digital and uh, green transition. Uh, we are added um, human development as a driver for change. Uh, we have added peace to peace and security because they are of the importance of peace and peace building for, for development. So we're trying to um, uh, consider all the development in the region and uh, uh, also in the EU that took place in the, in the last years and that would be significant in the coming years. So um, as you know, this agenda comes together, is accompanied by an economic and investment plan, um, which includes a series of actions uh, that would drive, help drive a sustainable and inclusive economy for, for everyone. So uh, there are flagship initiatives, there are 12 flag flagship initiatives that are mentioned, but they are indication. They are, uh, um, they're not uh, um, uh, prejudging the uh, ongoing programming process. So uh, there are ideas for, uh, for, for discussion with our, with our partners, Israel is also mentioned actively uh, and in, under flagship seven on digital transformation research and innovation because of the uh, great, great added value of Israel um, in those in those sectors. And in this document, we um, mentioned very clearly that the EU is ready to explore a further regional, sub-regional or trilateral cooperation and joint initiatives also in the light of the uh, normalization of relations between Israel and certain other countries. So this is uh, this agenda gives also kind of a uh, <clears throat> political support and uh, to the um, engagement in the normalization process. This is the last page of my presentation. Um, in the coming months, we will have uh, the approval of the uh, main financing instrument. It's called NDC, which stands for Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument and we will have the adoption of multi-annual programming. So the, um, the main programming document of the European Union for the action uh, in the region for the next uh, uh, seven years from 2021 to 2027. What does it mean in practice? That this is the time to exchange ideas. Um, it's a reflection time, how we can operationalize um, this, uh, this normalization process, how uh, the EU can support the process, uh, where Israel can bring and get added value. So not only in economic terms, of course, but also in political terms. Uh, for example, um, we attach a lot of importance to people-to-people uh, -people initiatives uh, that bring together municipalities, SMEs, schools, universities, associations, various associations, etc. Etc. Which areas are uh, most relevant? Uh, could be climate change, could be digitalization, could be uh, education skills. Climate change, of course, is a um, very important element in a region, uh, the Middle East, where um, which is warming, uh, uh, I think, 20% faster than other regions uh, in the world. Um, so it's also the time to come with initiatives. Um, for example, let me uh, mention an initiative that uh, the uh, EU delegation in Tel Aviv is uh, 
and now bringing forward together with the uh, Paris Center. So it's a series of online workshops on uh, um, different themes, on desertification, on renewable energy, on climate change, on water desalination. And here we have the participation of uh, experts from Israel, but also from the UAE, from Egypt, from Morocco, uh, from the Palestinian territory, uh, etc. So it's already an, an example of what, of what we can do to, um, uh, 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 to support this, this, uh, this, uh, this process. And uh, I will stop here. Uh, and uh, I'll be very, very interesting, uh, interested in knowing more of how do you see um, this going on? Because this is the time, uh, this is the time to come with ideas, and we are looking for that in Brussels. Well, Michele, thank you very much. You you made it eight minutes to the okay. exactly, so that's okay. And now uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Luigi Scarvieri. He's a researcher a fellow at the Center for European Reform. Please, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your, for your introduction, and thank you for inviting me to this, uh, this very timely event. So I'm going to start by, by just discussing my, uh, my view on the, on the renewed partnership and then uh, briefly talk about what I think the implications for, for Israel are. Now, there are, I think, some new elements in the partnership, as uh, as has been uh, mentioned, compared to previous EU policies towards the, the MENA region. Most prominently, there is this effort to, uh, to broaden the EU's agenda with greater prominence uh, given for, for the first time to, to green issues, to digital issues, which of course uh, reflects the, the importance of these topics in Europe, in Europe itself, and uh, greater emphasis to uh, youth, uh, women, and a, a people-centered agenda. Uh, including you know, human rights, the rule of law, um, the partnership similar to, uh, to previous EU documents uh, draws a link between uh, democracy and, and EU funding and the degree of EU support saying that there will be more assistance to countries that uh, respect democracy and the rule of law. Uh, and to back up all these goals, there is a, a 7 billion uh, envelope for seven years, which should be uh, in theory leveraged into 30 billion, although uh, not always fully clear how this, how this might be done. But on the whole, I did uh, have a, quite a strong sense of deja vu when, uh, when reading uh, the document. Um, perhaps the partnership didn't quite fully engage, I think, with some of the flaws uh, of the issues in, in EU policies towards the region in the past, and perhaps why EU policies have not always been uh, as successful as they, they might have. And to be specific, I think you know, the EU's trade offer has not really changed. Uh, there is some talk of fostering regulatory alignment. There is uh, the, the wish to reduce non-tariff barriers, the mentioned um, uh, new, uh, new rules of origin framework. Uh, but, but I think the reality remains that on the whole, the offer and uh, market access on agriculture is relatively limited. For free trade with Morocco and Tunisia uh, are stuck, um, partly because uh, arguably these agreements are a bit too ambitious, and you might need something more uh, more gradual and incremental. And this question is also connected to um, to the broader question, I think, of whether what the EU is offering is really uh, enough to incentivize partners to to undertake the reforms that they need to undertake to attract investment and to grow. I also think that the EU uh, will continue to struggle with the security democracy dilemma. Uh, again, this is, uh, as I mentioned, not new. The EU has always uh, emphasized democratic conditionalities less in the 2015 uh, iteration of the policy than in the, the 2011 one, but nonetheless, uh, perhaps not lived up to it in, in practice. Uh, I'm thinking of, for example, large uh, scale support to, to Egypt, despite that country doing very little in terms of improving its democracy. Uh, and uh, more broadly, I think there's the issue that the European model is perhaps becoming less attractive in the region uh, and less visible uh, because there are uh, alternatives. You know, China and Russia are, are growing more and more influential and the Gulf model has always, has always been there. But on the whole, I actually doubt that you know, democracy promotion will be such a priority for the EU. 
the priorities, in my view, will uh, will continue to be uh, un underneath the surface those of uh, cooperating in the management of migration, uh, cooperating in reducing uh, the risk of terrorism and fostering stability. But I think perhaps where the partnership is weakest is. Uh, and has the least to say is is in the field of uh, of security. Uh, the EU has, you know, in recent years, been uh, uninfluential. I could say maybe that's a bit mean, but not not very influential in its efforts to uh, to resolve regional conflicts. Whether we think of Syria, Libya, Iraq, uh, or, or Yemen, and uh, and member states have often been divided. Uh, for example, also in their uh, in the way they viewed Turkey's assertive foreign policy in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the renewed partnership does say that the EU wants to play a bigger role in these uh, in, in conflict resolution, but uh, it, it acknowledges that you know ultimately this depends on whether member states are uh, are on the same page, are united, are behind this agenda. And uh, I think there are two issues. Yes, one of them being divisions between member states, which often hinder the EU's action, and the second is a broader uh, unwillingness, perhaps, to. Um, to take on hard hard matters of uh, or hard security challenges and to uh, to think strategically about these matters uh, and you know i think in general the eu is perhaps going to be focused more on internal matters in the next couple of years with external um, the external agenda not having as much prominence as as we might like it to have and in particular the EU will be focused on ensuring that the, the recovery from the COVID pandemic is as even as possible across all member states. Now turning just quite quickly to, to uh, the implications for Israel, I don't, my, my view is that the renewed partnership doesn't herald any major changes uh, in EU policy. Uh, European companies, governments, the EU itself, will, of course, uh, as we've heard, continue to work with Israel, find, find ways to work with Israel to develop and deepen their research links, their economic links, their societal links. And, uh, and there's probably a more potential, uh, most potential perhaps, to uh, cooperate in the, in the green and digital fields. And, uh, and Israel will also continue, I'm sure, to work together with, uh, with uh, many member states. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about Greece and Cyprus in terms of security. Uh, th th there might not be so much cooperation on, on other issues. I'm thinking, for example, of, of the Iran uh, potential revival of the Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action. Um, and, and of course, the EU will welcome, as, as, you know, as it has, greater cooperation between Israel and Arab states and greater links uh, uh, in the framework of the Abram Accords. And if they may be expanded, better so. At the same time, of course, the EU uh, and will continue to try to advance uh, or rather perhaps preserve the possibility of a two-state solution. Uh, the renewed partnership ex document explicitly states that the EU wants to re-engage to reach a settlement. Uh, in practice, I think you know, this will amount to two things. One of them, trying to foster greater democracy and accountability in the, in the PA. And secondly, I think member states might be uh, willing to, uh, to take another look at the differentiation agenda in response to, uh, to Israeli settlement building uh, the legal framework is already in place uh, to differentiate between entities in, in Israel and the, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, but it's not being fully implemented. So there, uh, there might be gradual moves in that direction. Uh, and, and I think the EU might also uh, you know, gradually uh, put more pressure on Israel to ease restrictions on movement in the West Bank and, um, and an access in Gaza. But, you know, to conclude, I think having said all that, it's not really, at least my view, is that it's not going to be a, a real priority uh, for the EU. The EU won't be, I think, particularly vigorous on this uh, dossier, in part because of the internal divisions of which we are all uh, very aware of. But the issue does matter to Europe. And I think, you know, the broader question, perhaps standing behind the, this, uh, the theme of this panel, is if over time member states become... Uh, more and more member states become convinced that actually what you have is the emergence of a one-state reality, then there will be a shift, which will be very slow, but I think it will uh, undoubtedly then affect those prospects for closer EU-Israel uh, cooperation that we have been uh, talking about. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Uh, so we heard the uh, European External Service and some remarks from a European researcher and now we're turning to the Israeli side, and actually uh, 
I'm happy to, uh, to invite uh, Noah Gensal, who is a counselor at our mission in Brussels, uh, in, in the multilateral human rights development and EU internal affairs specialist. So, Noah, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you to, to the organizers for putting this event together. It's a pleasure to be joining you here today. Uh, and also to get another uh, um, piece of evidence that there's more than a few people who are interested in this topic. Sometimes when you're dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis, you feel like you're the only one who notices all these papers coming out of Brussels. So it's always nice to see that this is, uh, these are developments that are of interest and that are being followed by um, all those who are in fact affected by them. Uh, and I say affected because I think that uh, the, the renewed approach to the Southern neighborhood is a very important development uh, in the way that the European Union views its uh, immediate neighborhood uh, and one that it worked quite extensively on uh, in partnership uh, with, its, uh, with its neighborhood. Uh, and uh, Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi also participated in uh, discussions uh, that uh, the commission uh, Commissioner Barheli of the Neighborhood and High Representative Borrell uh, conducted with uh, the Southern Neighborhood countries in order to better understand what their priorities and what their challenges are when uh, drafting and putting together this, um, this joint communication and renewed approach to the neighborhood. And uh, really what, what came through these discussions in a very clear way uh, is I think a lesson that we've all learned in the past year, um, even without this other neighborhood uh, angle. And that really is uh, the porous nature of our borders. This is something that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, made quite evident. And I think that when we look through the Southern neighborhood um, strategy, it really showcases the way in which we all share uh, joint challenges and in which the region really needs to further uh, enrich in and deepen the dialogue between the partners and the way in which the European Union has a very clear interest in tapping into that dis discussion and ensuring that its priorities are well understood and well translated into the national level and to utilize its leadership in order to uh, foster better relations between the different partners who together need to uh, cooperate in a way uh, to, um, to work on these joint challenges. Because when we speak of energy, when we speak of climate, when we speak also of defense and security, these are no longer uh, phenomena that are happening in separate countries. These are all regional issues that require dialogue. And uh, that is why for us, it was very important to see uh, the way in which the new approach, the Southern Neighborhood uh, really connects to what in our view is the most important uh, development in the region. Of course, it won't surprise you that uh, as an Israeli, uh, this year has been first and foremost been uh, under the symbol of uh, normalization and of expanding Israel's relations uh, with uh, new partners. And to see the European Union uh, really taking on uh, this, uh, this development in such uh, a strong way through the Southern neighborhood Basically, in a sense, uh, it's really a connection in the most tangible way between localized developments, regional developments, and uh, European and neighborhood um, relations. Uh, for us, that is uh, very important because it really addresses uh, the way in which the European Union approaches Israel. Uh, we have been uh, uh, very clear on the fact that normalization has brought along a change of paradigm for the region, for Israel and the Arab and the Muslim world. And we also see for it very positive implications for the European Union, both internally and uh, from a regional perspective. And here, uh, Europe really is able to strengthen its role in the region by tapping into these uh, new developments. Uh, we're looking forward to, to further exploring what this will mean for our relations. We want to really get into the more operational um, elements and more concrete ideas. It was a pleasure to hear Michele already alluding to certain projects coming up. We want to see these also furthered 
through uh, finally drafting a partnership priorities agreement between Israel and the EU, which is something that is very lacking in our relations. Um, but really, you know, what we've seen in the past year is just uh, um, very exciting, I have to say on a personal level, really exciting enthusiasm uh, with which normalization has been received in Israel and in, in our new partners uh, countries. And it's really been embraced and so many initiatives and ideas of cooperation are already happening. And these are gonna take place with Europe or without Europe. And we want to see Europe, the European Union and European member states as a very clear partner in this. And uh, we think that this is something that ultimately serves a lot to um, embolden the European Union's relevance in the region and its relevance also to Israel, both uh, domestically and also in the context of Israeli-Palestinian relations. Uh, when there are such strong changes happening, uh, you cannot ignore what is happening. You need to tap into that. Uh, and that is why in our view, uh, the Southern neighborhood really allows the European Union to expand the conversation vis-a-vis -vis Israel in the region. And by showing that the EU engages more broadly with Israel on topics that are of interest to Israel and to its partners, it will send a very important message also in terms of uh, the type of relations that it's seeking. And I think that it will do a lot also to improve both the relations uh, between Europeans and Israel and also to improve the European Union's image in Israel, which is something that is also important and serves as uh, a backdrop to the more political and economic relations that we hold. So I will stop here uh, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions and hearing your comments. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Noah. Uh, uh, now we'll, uh, uh, we'll turn to Dr. Maya Sion Fitiao. Uh, she's the co-president of the Israeli uh, Association for Studies of European Integration. Uh, and she's the director of the program on Israel-European relations also with the Mitvim Institute. And uh, please, Maya, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Danny. And I wish to stress that uh, I have multiple hats. So here in this event, I am speaking under my hat as the director of the Israeli Europe program at Mitvim. Um, and first, I think, I mean, we all know from our own experience um, the importance of living in a good neighborhood. We all wish to live in a peaceful and flourishing area surrounded by friendly neighbors. Um, and the same goes to, um, to countries and between countries. So the U European Union is an inspiring example for turning uh, bloodshed, <clears throat> bloodshed Europe into a peaceful, stable, flourishing political entity in which neighbors cooperate with one another. And since its foundation, the EU wished to export its model first by enlargement, by joining other European countries as its members. And then 25 years ago, when the Oslo process began between Israelis and Palestinians, and a peace agreement was signed between Israel and Jordan, then the EU saw this as an opportunity to further export its model, turning a bloodshed southern Mediterranean region, in which Israel was a focal point of wars and conflicts, into a peaceful region. It began investing in the southern Mediterranean, aiming to foster stability and social economic development through the Barcelona process. Now, needless to elaborate, 25 years later, the region is less stable and the social economic challenges are even more immense uh, and the corona uh, epidemic just made them even uh, more challenging. So what opportunities does the renewed partnership offers to Israel and the region? What can be the implications for EU-Israeli relations? I want to focus more on this aspect of EU-Israeli relations. And then I identify uh, the opportunities already raised here about the inter-regional, uh, sub-regional, trilateral cooperation, and uh, also between EU-Israeli relations. I have one political evaluation which uh, puts a question mark on those issues. And I think Luigi touched upon something that I would relate to maybe afterwards. And then I have four recommendations to EU uh, and to, the, to Israel. So first, the joint communication on the renewed partnership sets an opportunity for regional and inter-regional cooperation in light of those normalization agreements that Israel signed. And I quote from the document, the EU will be ready to explore further regional, sub-regional or trilateral cooperation and joint initiatives between partner countries across the board 
including in light of the recent normalization of relations between Israel and a number of Arab countries. So this is a quote. And then with regards to inter-regional cooperation, the Gulf is mentioned specifically in the joint communication and so is the Red Sea area. So hence the recommendation is that Israel and Arab countries it has relations with, and that relates also to Jordan and to Egypt and possibly perhaps even the Palestinian Authority. Um, and obviously the United Arab Emirates and Morocco should decide together bilaterally or together what regional and inter-regional projects to suggest to the EU. And indeed, Michele, you gave one small example, uh, but many projects can be envisaged under those goals uh, that the EU set, be it an infrastructure to enhance economic relations uh, or green and digital transition, climate uh, change, etc. Now, the indirect opportunity is the improvement of EU-Israeli relations if the above process, this normalization process would uh, take place, this uh, regional um, cooperation. So, however, the realization of this opportunity depends on whether the EU will apply conditionality here. And this relates to my second point, which is more a political observation, and that is the next government in Israel will not be able to advance the Middle East peace process, now be it a unity government between right wing of Tali Bennett and left wing um, Nitzan Horowitz, or be it another Netanyahu government, there is uh, no uh, political will or ability to do so uh, in, such, uh, in such formations of governments. However, the normalization agreements um, have potential to change the mindset and put the right infrastructure, regional infrastructure, to further resumption of the Middle East peace process. And I, hear the, I think this is the value that the EU grasps, and I will elaborate that uh, in a minute. So third, as I said, I have four recommendations to Israel and the EU. Recommendation A is that the next foreign minister of Israel should take advantage, obviously, of the options uh, the renewed partnership presents. And in general, the foreign minister should adopt a positive and constructive position towards the EU, as Foreign Minister Ashkenazi have already uh, made, and should visit Brussels um, um, and not only the capitals of the EU member state. And I think this is really important. Um, recommendation B is addressed to the European Union to renew the Association Council with Israel. The European Commission's joint communication speaks about the importance of dialogue. And I quote here again from the document, it proposes to strengthen significantly, significantly the political and policy dialogue across the Mediterranean. Um, and I will elaborate on that in a, in a minute. Now, such political improvement may lead recommend, to recommendation C, which as Noah said, to sign partnership priorities with Israel. And again, I will elaborate on that. And then if recommendation C takes place, or, takes place of signing partnership priorities with Israel, then recommendation D uh, can also take place that Israel should evaluate whether it desires to start a negotiation on what's called a deep and comprehensive free trade area with the European Union, which is also a general option, uh, which is mentioned in the joint communication. Uh, Morocco and Tunisia are having such negotiations. Um, uh, I think Luigi, you referred to that. Um, the EU-Israeli Association Agreement, signed already in 1995, is old. Trade agreements have changed considerably in the past two, three decades. From free trade area dealing with trading goods, the two, three decades um, afterwards, we see much more necess necessity to deal with um, services, with non-trade barriers, with um, um, non-trade um, uh, barriers and uh, investments, for example. Okay, so those are options to advance the relations. And uh, I want to elaborate on those uh, opportunities and um, uh, recommendations. So first, with regarding to the normalization agreements and regional and inter-regional cooperation, um, in the Commission joint communication, there is not much emphasis on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It is indeed mentioned, and the two-state solution is, is mentioned, but it's not stressed. Um, and normalization agreements are mentioned in relations to those opportunities, as I said, those regional, interregional, and trilateral cooperation. And it's interesting to note that in a press conference, a conference, the commissioner of DG NIR, um, dealing with the European neighborhood policy, 
expressed the Commission's positive position on the normalization agreements as an opportunity the EU should enhance, and he said the following. And, and this is sets the atmosphere within the EU. We see a major opportunity emerging with the Abraham Agreements. We see that the normalization process has begun between Israel and Arab neighbors. We would like to help this process, also by front-loading some of the very tangible specific actions that can contribute to building confidence, trust through trade, economic cooperation, and through scientific cooperation between these countries. We value the peace this can create. If we are able to go back to the times uh, and ideas of the uh, Madrid conference, we would have much more opportunity to come to long-term solutions. And for the past uh, decade, the Middle East peace process, as we all know, was uh, stuck. Due to the linkage policy, no further upgrading of the EU-Israeli relations took place as long as the peace process did not advance. And to a great extent, EU-Israeli political uh, relations, not just the economic or the functional technical ones, the political rela relations reflected that stalemate. The normalization agreements bring new hope for promoting some of the region uh, towards more peace, economic development and stability. And I hope this positive attitude expressed by the Commission will also convince the 27 foreign ministers of the EU to go ahead with such interregional cooperation as the renewed partnership aspires. And this can build the foundations for a renewed um, renewal of the Middle East peace process uh, in the future. So regarding the resumptions, very shortly regarding the resumptions of the Israel-EU Association Council meetings, it is true that the relations between Israel and the EU can develop even without such high level political dialogue, but renewal of the Association Council, which last took place in July 2012, can improve the relations and strengthen the political commitments. And also an EU-Israeli Association uh, Council is it's not a prize, right? It's a commitment the EU and Israel took upon themselves. Um, and holding other association council and withholding that from Israel is, is imbalanced. So last point regarding signing of partnership priorities. Also in 2015, the EU conducted a review of the neighborhood policy, and it then proposed to neighbors to conclude those partnership priorities that Noah mentioned. And it's a document which will identify the priorities to advance bilaterally. Now Israel started this uh, process of, uh, you know, trying to uh, figure out these uh, partnership priorities, but then uh, some member states' objection under the leakage policy put a, a stop to this process. And at the same time, the EU concluded such partnership priorities with Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. But I want to stress uh, one important point, that even if no partnership priority is signed between EU and Israel, uh, on the positive side, the joint communication that the uh, Commission published allows to develop such priorities on the basis of equivalent policy document. And in 2005, Israel signed an action plan with the EU, and this is an action plan, this is the old generation of the partnership priorities, so the action plan can serve as a basis to which further develop, uh, we can further develop the relations. Um, it's not updated, it's not an ideal document to work upon, but it is there, it's very elaborate, and it can form the basis to further develop the functional relations. Um, so I thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. I think you pointed out to some uh, very interesting and pertinent uh, points. Uh, I will now open uh, the, uh, the floor for, for questions. Uh, I have uh, already uh, uh, got one or two questions uh, to start with. So I will, uh, I will ask uh, uh, Professor Tobias uh, you are the first one to ask the question, so please, if you can, unmute yourself and, uh, and make, uh, make your comment or actually the question that you have. Please, Professor Tobias. Good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, my two questions are the following. Um, as Maya uh, uh, has uh, reminded us, uh, one of the items in the old action plan on which uh, both the EU and uh, Israel had uh, put uh, uh, much hope is the discussions or negotiations towards free trade in services, because both sides are service economies. As far as I can read the new documents concerning this new approach uh, of e Euromed relations, I don't see anything reminding me uh, the wish 
uh, of the EU to uh, work for the liberalization of trade in services, and that worries me a lot. Uh, uh, a lot. Uh, might I ask uh, uh, the speakers in Brussels uh, to clarify for me if, if my fears are unfounded or not? Uh, that's my, my first uh, question. The other one is that uh, the uh, phraseology used in the new uh, document uh, is borrowed uh, in part from the phraseology being used uh, in the Union for the Mediterranean. And in particular, um, you, we had uh, our uh, first speaker mention that co-ownership would be one of the leading principles of the new approach. Uh, well, that was one of the reasons uh, that uh, the Union for the Mediterranean was created because of uh, uh, a sense that, uh, that the Southerners were not well represented. Uh, now, I have the impression that uh, the EU with its uh, power of finance is going to uh, relegate uh, even more to the side the Union for the Mediterranean because uh, in part, it, it wants to take a leading role in co-ownership. So could you uh, specify or clarify for me that I am again wrong? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tobias, uh, for those two questions. So I, I suggest, because I uh, maybe that uh, we'll ask our panelists very shortly to maybe respond, uh, one on the service question and the other one on the... Uh, distinction, if I can say, or the non-distinction between the, the UFM and the overall southern policy. So maybe uh, uh, I will give the first floor to uh, we do the reverse side. So maybe we start with, uh, with Maya and then we move uh, uh, to Noah, to Luigi and to Michele. So please, uh, Maya. Thank you, Danny, and thank you, Alfred, for your questions. Um, I think actually the, the burden uh, of answer is on, on Michele this time. Um, but I support Alfred in, in what he's saying. I mean, the trade in services is much more important nowadays uh, in the trade relations between the EU and Israel. During the past year, um, the trade in services became equivalent in size to the trade in goods between the EU and Israel. Um, so the importance of liberalization in this field is, is definitely um, should, should uh, be prioritized uh, as, as long as it, um, uh, it, it's um, you know, in Israel's interest. And I think also in, in, obviously in the EU's interest. Uh, and with regard to the co-ownership, I would uh, leave it to Michele to answer. Uh, Noah, Noah, can you... Uh... Can you tell us something about, uh, about the two questions? I'd agree with Maya, but uh, Michael would probably be the best uh, to, to respond. But I would just say uh, in regards with the Union for the Mediterranean, um, it's possible, of course, to utilize similar concepts of successful cooperation and, and co-ownership is definitely one of them uh, in parallel uh, approaches and parallel programs. Union for the Mediterranean, of course, does not encompass uh, exactly the southern neighborhood. And so we're looking at two different and separate geographical areas, although in, a lot of them do overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would not say that, at least in, in the way that we've approached uh, the new uh, renewed partnership for the southern neighborhood, we haven't mm -hmm. seen it uh, conflicting with the Union for the Mediterranean. And if anything, I think that it would be able to uh, further strengthen um, the, the way in which the UFM's priorities are then um, uh, pursued with additional attention and resources being allocated for it from the side of the commission, which is always a very good thing when you're looking at regional programming. But I'll stop here if that's okay, and I'll let uh, Michele uh, continue. Yes, well, Luigi, quickly, maybe you can Luigi. also invite us. Please, Luigi. Just, uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, on the topic of deeper comprehensive free trade agreements, I mean, they do include a, a service element, a relatively substantial one, as far as free trade agreements go. Um, 
and the EU is still trying to negotiate DCFTAs with uh, several countries in the region, whether Israel uh, is also at some stage one of those, uh, that's uh, up to, to European leaders to, to decide, but it does have a service component, so the adoption is on the table. And on the UFN? I don't really have anything to add to what's been said on that, so I'll leave uh, it to Michele. Thank you. So, Michele, now... Uh... All the eyes are on you. What, what can you say on the UFM and the services? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, um, of course, services are a growing component of trade today. Um, and when trade is mentioned in the, um, in the communication, I mean, it doesn't mean just trading goods. It means also trading services. And uh, uh, we say in the communication that there is an interest in modernizing trade and investment relation with the EU. Uh, this includes services for sure. Um, then, uh, with Israel, yes, it's true that uh, um, the, the DCFTA, uh, for the time being, I mean, there are no, um, there's no, there is, uh, I mean, this, this option is not necessarily on the table yet, um, it's not under, under discussion, um, but um, still the, the agreement that we have with, the, with Israel uh, also touches on services. And uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, bilateral exchange services is growing a lot. So it's definitely something that is present in our, in our uh, discussion with Israel. Then on the UFM, uh, the, uh, the joint communication doesn't want to, or the new strategy doesn't want to replace the UFM, or want to accompany the UFM and this, and this approach. Uh, the UFM is mentioned several times. And uh, of course, we see uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this new strategy, this new approach as something reinforcing this, um, this, this regional approach, uh, which in several sectors is proving uh, uh, quite useful. Thank you. Well, we have uh, uh, two other questions, uh, Gilad Segal and uh, Muriel Osberg. So maybe Gilad, you'll be unmute and you can uh, actually ask the question. And all those who are not speaking, please uh, mute yourself. Thank you. So, Gilad, please. Thank you, Danny. Um, I've, uh, it's been a long time since I've uh, participated in one of the events of ISCI, and it's a pleasure. Uh, and maybe I have too many questions because of that. So please stop me uh, if I exaggerate. Uh, so first of all, I would like to ask about, uh, uh, to refer a question to Michele. Uh, Michele, you've mentioned very briefly the normalization. So if you, if you met the peace agreements with the Arab countries, then I would like to ask you to try to be a little bit more specific about uh, specific programs where you see that the EU can uh, play a, a positive role in the developments, in the, in the regional developments, and, and, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and also how would it affect uh, EU's uh, uh, I'd say priorities in peacemaking. Um, and second thing, also political, uh, about the, uh, the, the, maybe to Luigi, uh, who's talking about uh, the, the, the enhancing democracy at the PA, uh, how does the EU see this, uh, you know, it's quite of a pickle here, which, uh, you know, do we run elections? How exactly do we support the democracy uh, which you know we might risk in having a terror, a EU designated terror entity uh, winning the election. So uh, how does the EU plans to go about this? Maybe one more specific question. I don't know if I know it's not really exactly related to the to the topic today, but it's very very important for EU Israel relations. If you can please uh, mention one comment about the new framework program and how Israel would. How do you see Israel's participation in it? Um, maybe in the view of, of the region, of the ENP and the southern neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, thank you. By the way, I also saw that uh, Morocco was uh, mentioned in the paper as eventually being part of the, uh, of the horizon. So, but uh, but I, I'll keep my question for the end. Now we've got uh, Muriel. Muriel Osberg, please. Thanks a lot. And thanks for organizing this very interesting debate. Uh, I would have a question on Israel-Arab normalization and what the EU can actually do in that context. And I have to say I'm a bit uh, reluctant to see so many opportunities because most of the interests from Israel and Arab states that engage in normalization mm -hmm. are actually very much linked to the US 
or they are direct bilateral interests in civil and security relations where the EU doesn't have a role to play. But I do see two fields, and I would like to get your reaction to that. And, and the one is on the green, green economy. I think there is a lot of room. Uh, and the second one is actually on conflict management and conflict transformation. And one idea that is specifically mentioned in the Abraham Accords is tourism and pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Um, now, what, what I'm thinking about is uh, if the EU, together with Israel and Gulf states, could develop a scheme of investment in tourism and pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Muslims and Christians from the region, in a way that it would serve the local residents of East Jerusalem, uh, that it would, it would help maintain an Arab presence in East Jerusalem, and it would also help to preserve Arab culture um, and religion in East Jerusalem. Um, and I think that could be one positive contribution to conflict transformation between Israel and its neighbors. And I'd like to hear what you think about that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Michele, please, uh, maybe you can bring uh, more, more meat to the normalization and uh, uh, that the EU will bring on the table, please. So, uh, on the question on programs where the EU could uh, have a role in, in this normalization, uh, well, uh, this is actually the question, the same question as the, I also have, um, because we are in this exp exploration phase. Um, they, it is the same word that we, uh, that we used in the, um, in the uh, joint communication. So uh, what are, uh, what are er areas? Um, uh, what are uh, um, areas where Israel can bring uh, can bring added value? I can also um, uh, receive added value from uh, from the countries that are that are uh, including this normalization process. Then let's do not forget that there is a, a or there are already uh, regional programs. So there is a, already a cooperation of Israel with other um, countries of the region, with Arab countries of the region, in the context of EU programs. Um, so this is a little bit also for Israel and the other partners, you know, to show what, for in their opinion, is really important to to support. And uh, there are uh, certain uh, certain priorities at EU level. Of course, climate change is one uh, is maybe the third, the most important because it's affecting so um, so uh, hardly the region. Um, then. Uh, also, the um, the financial tools that are at the disposal of the EU, uh, notably this NDICI, is more flexible uh, than the instrument that were that uh, I've been there so far. Uh, so ideas uh, can get uh, maybe can be supported in a more flexible um, way than before. So it did the it did the time you know to come with the, with suggestions. Uh, and I'm afraid, I mean, I cannot maybe uh, give a, a complete answer <laughs> to, this, to this question. Um, then on... Uh, um, shall I re reply to... Go ahead, go ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead with the other, the, the other question. Yes, on, on, ele on election, I mean, um, uh, of course, do, you, do you support the uh, uh, process, the electoral process in Palestine, which is... A, has been suspended. Uh, there has been a, a statement by the high representative uh, on the fact that you know we're quite disappointed that this is not going on. Uh, how we would react if uh, if a terrorist organization would come to government? I mean, I cannot speculate on that. This is a very delicate issue. Um, of course, the EU expects you know any uh, Palestinian authority to abide by uh, certain rules. So um, the to acknowledge Israel. To uh, abide by the agreements that have been uh, um, concluded so far, to renounce violence, uh, but I cannot say I cannot say more than that uh, at this point in time. Uh, then the Horizon Europe program is uh, extremely important for the EU and extremely important for Israel. Israel has been one of the champions of the Horizon 2020, and I think is very much determined in being still involved 
uh, in this in this one uh, very very um, thoroughly, and then maybe Noah will add on that. But this is the, definitely a great priority for Israel. Uh, then. Um, what Muriel said, I mean, this idea on, on tourism for conflict management, conflict transformation is one uh, is already one of, I mean, very good idea that they noted down and that uh, let's see if uh, uh, this can uh, uh, develop into something concrete. Um, and then on, on green economy, um, definitely um, this is uh, something uh, that is very important in the EU, but we also see in our bilateral dialogue with Israel a lot of interest in, in uh, this concept, in the concept of the circular economy as well. And this is something where the technology uh, of Israel could be very, very useful in fostering also the, uh, this, kind, this kind of approach in other, in other countries in the region. So that's it, I would leave. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Luigi, maybe you can address uh, and give your, you. your point of view. Yeah. Um, well, on the, you know, if uh, if Hamas had won the election, obviously the EU would have been in a in a very bad uh, position. I think uh, everyone was that wouldn't. Um, in terms of funding, I mean, the EU is a very important funder for the PA. So there's things that it can do in terms of I think conditionality to um, to try to incentivize some kind of reform, perhaps to reduce corruption at the margins and to uh, make sure that the PA, uh, you know, of, of course, it's not going to happen overnight, but to reduce, if possible, payments to, uh, to martyrs. Um, but the EU's role may be overestimated in this. I think it's going to be at the, at the margins. And in a sense, that of the PA is, is one example of that um, stability democracy uh, dilemma that I spoke of. You know, the EU has been supporting the PA a lot because it's worried about what will happen if, uh, if, there was no, if it were no longer there. On, um, on the question of normalization, I agree that, you know, the EU's incentives are, we, we perhaps tend to overestimate them and the EU might not have a huge role. The, the idea of tourism and East Jerusalem, I agree, is a, is a good one. On the Green Deal, I would just say that while it might be an area of cooperation, maybe we overestimate how much cooperation is possible. So one of the key elements of the Green Deal will be a border common adjustment mechanism, which will mean taxing uh, imports into the EU that uh, have a higher, uh, that, have, that are not taxed at, at source. So you know, unless countries have a mechanism in place that is equivalent to that of the EU, then they, that could introduce a new trade barrier. And the EU is in discussions with the US to make sure that its system is, is compatible. But in terms of how this will affect countries in the region, the impact will be different country by country, but it's something to, I think, bear in mind when we talk about green issues. Thank you. Uh, Noah? Uh, first of all, I hope that if uh, anyone in the audience is joining us from Jerusalem, that you were all able to find a safe place to shelter as uh, rockets are launched from Gaza to central Israel and to Jerusalem, and we hope for safety for all people there. Uh, now, uh, regarding the questions uh, that were asked, uh, I think that there is a lot of potential in terms of uh, concrete projects. And I think that the fact that uh, in certain areas the EU was not um, a strong uh, participant, as Muriel said, and these were areas that were more strongly uh, dominated, let's say, by um, a US uh, partnership, uh, doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that, that the potential is not there for, for new cooperation. And when we look at the at the list, I mean, there's so much that can provide the basis for cooperation, of course, from a, a people to people projects that Michele alluded to beforehand. But all, you know, they really run the entire gamut from uh, climate, uh, you know, I would particularly mark uh, desertification and water management. These are very clear uh, uh, areas in which Israel has a lot to share with its neighbors. And truly, Israel is already sharing a lot with its neighbors and with its regional partners. But uh, uh, with the EU's help, I think that we would be able to take this uh, to a, a, uh, you know, a wider place, but also to contextualize it within uh, um, a new political dialogue with countries in the region. So if we're looking at projects that are already happening you know, in the private sector, uh, business to business, we can turn into business to government. We can turn it into government to government. And these things 
in the end become political capital that allow also to further goals uh, of, from a political nature in the region. And that's, that's where the EU needs to uh, understand really the potential of normalization and how it can utilize it to further both its own priorities and also its political priorities in the region. So, uh, you know, when we look even at areas outside of the Southern neighborhood, for perhaps Central Africa, that is dealing with a very, very, uh, with, you know, very um, um, challenging uh, um, uh, obstacles in, uh, in the field of water that create a destabilizing effect, but then uh, affect also the political stability and perhaps even, you know, relations, uh, the way in which migration flows go into Europe. You know, these things could potentially be addressed with Israeli, EU, you know, cooperation with other countries in the region towards a fourth area. I mean, really, you have to be as creative as possible in the way in which you utilize this new paradigm to uh, further advance your own goals as Europe and, you know, our regional goals as Israel within the southern neighborhood. So that's really just, you know, just a quick example, but um, we can talk about medical cooperation specifically, you know, in the context of COVID-19, training of medical staff, dealing with pandemics, dealing with emergencies, um, SMEs, uh, working on, uh, on uh, you know, women business empowerment, um, financial schemes for uh, improving, you know, from poverty to ownership to entrepreneurship. Uh, really, we can go anywhere we want with this. The idea is truly to try and see what every partner can bring to the table and how we can join those together in order to also advance European priorities in the region. Uh, so, you know, it's true that at times when, um, when there's too many options, it's difficult to choose, uh, but I think that we're, we're facing a very good problem right now. And uh, we just need to put some things on the board and to get talking, of course, we require also a political framework in which we can discuss, discuss these things. And that's something that, as we said, the Israel, Israel and the EU, unfortunately, uh, need to do some work on to further explore these ideas. Uh, thank you, thank you, Noah. Uh, and uh, can we have uh, uh, Maya, please? Can you address those, those questions? Yeah, uh, thank Maya, you, Noah. Please. This was. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Uh, no, and this was really inspiring. You gave a lot of examples, and, and I think it's uh, really the imagination um, and creativity is, is the strong side of Israelis. So um, each of each and every one of us can uh, can um, contribute something. And this is a point that I want to stress. Actually, um, you know, the EU looks at the southern region as a region that the EU can contribute to the region. But Israel is very different from the other countries in the region. And actually, Israel can contribute to those countries. So, for example, Israel enjoys very much the twinning and tie projects. But Israel can also give uh, tie projects to its neighbors. So why not open it to a more um, really um, uh, co-ownership in that sense? And also send Israeli experts um, via the EU mechanism of tie for example, to uh, Arab countries, um, obviously the ones that, that Israel has re have relations with. Now, uh, it was mentioned that Israel can um, very much contribute to the digital uh, transformation or, or uh, transition of those countries, to training, to uh, projects, infrastructure, business. Um, men and women in Israel can start investing in those countries with the help of this program because as was mentioned, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was Luigi or Michele that were, were mentioning it, but the EU is going to, um, is, is putting 7 billion um, euros on this program, but it wants to uh, have 30 other billion euros invested by uh, financial um, institutions such as the European Investment Bank, such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the IMF and other institutions, and by private investors. So this is also an opportunity for Israeli private investors and Arab private investors, and we see it happening already uh, between um, the UAE and, and Israel, for example. Uh, Israel can definitely contribute on agriculture, on water uh, issues, on solar energy, uh, and that's not only the government. It's also, as Noah was mentioning, the you know the business sector and the innovation, the high tech sector in in Israel. 
Um, in the program itself of the communication uh, of the commission, uh, in the joint communication, there was a mentioning of the Allenby bridge crossing between Israel and Jordan. So also some projects can be made there. Uh, Erasmus program can be opened also to students coming from the region to uh, other countries uh, in the region. Um, Horizon was mentioned here. Um, uh, Muriel, to your um, question about tourism, I think that uh, uh, government to government, uh, I, I don't see how government to government agreements on tourism can um, put emphasis on developing East Jerusalem. I do see it by private uh, investors, and, and that can be done. Uh, but government to government, it's hard to see how uh, you, you can do that. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it should, it should be examined. Um, and I, I join what Luigi was saying about the elections uh, in the Palestinian Authority that definitely puts a question mark on democratization processes vis-a-vis -vis stability. And um, uh, we've seen that taking place with the Hamas in 2006, um, you know, coming to power. Uh, that didn't do any good to the Middle East peace process or, or to the Palestinian um, themselves. So um, those processes are, as was mentioned, extremely delicate. And um, I, I, Israel shouldn't be involved in that. Uh, but the EU um, does wish to take a role in, in, in some of the processes. So, um, you know, uh, we can hope for the best. Um, but, but maybe not to uh, not be negligent on, on this issue. Um, I think I'll stop here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Well, I'll, I'll take the liberty of being the moderator to, uh, to add and also some, ask some questions. I think that Maya made a point which I, I would like, uh, especially Michele and maybe even Noah, to look upon it. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, when I read the, 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 the documentation, it all looks very familiar and there is no fresh thinking of changing the whole architecture. You are still looking at Europe and its sphere of influence that you want to enlarge. I think we are out of that. And I'm sorry, I'm not very diplomatic nowadays. And especially the normalization with the Gulf country is totally changing the situation. Uh, and, 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 and I don't see it enough in your thinking uh, because you continue to try to, to uh, to extend your norms to the Mediterranean, and we have been trying to do that for the last 25 years, uh, not very successfully, by the way, uh, uh, but because of, of many reasons. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not blaming the European. I think that there are problems on the north, on the south, but maybe we should change the whole approach uh, of, of trying to, to change something. I, I'm just thinking, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll let my, uh, uh, my uh, imagination go, uh, go wild. I mean, there were talks about a new community of water and energy, okay, those are, and, and climate change, who knows? I mean, some, the region here has a problem, a major problem in terms of water, in terms of energy, renewable energy connected to the green. Why not to talk in totally two di different, different uh, 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 terms, okay, of creating different structure, okay, of bringing the, the you, you talk about the intra-trade in the South is still very low and still we are looking at the center and the periphery. We should change all that and you don't address enough all the question of uh, a South-South type of cooperation, how Europe can do something about it because this is a major problem and not the, the, to continue this center-periphery type of relation. By the way, I don't see uh, uh, neither any any uh, reference to external uh, uh, power that are coming, which are either threatening or maybe can be a chance to the region. China is present in the Mediterranean, and I don't see any reference to, to how to either join forces with a third party or a country, maybe uh, do something together and bring the Chinese in some uh, positive way. So uh, again, those are the type of wild questions that I would like to have reference to because I think that uh, uh, it's lacking and, and really what is lacking is a new thinking, a new way of, of looking at the region and, and uh, most of it, uh, I, I just put Israel in the three communication, the name Israel. It appears, I think, three times. That's it. Okay, so we are really not part of that type of dialogue because we are an OECD country and what actually uh, uh, Maya just said about 
bringing Israel on the European side, we already talked about it many years ago, about we not being a southern partner, but we are a bit different. So I know it's very difficult to make uh, differentiation and to treat everybody differently, etc. But, but look, I mean, uh, we are 25 years of experience, and should we try maybe something else? Sorry for being a bit blunt, but please, Michele. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for for all these points, which are very um, which are very interesting for sure. Um, um, I see I see the joint communication. I mean, as a partnership, meaning as an attempt to bring uh, cooperation and dialogue to um, a, say a different level, to a more modern level, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, tools that are um, a little bit more flexible. Uh, with more opportunities for dialogue, dialogue and co, um, saying co, uh, co ownership. Yes, this is you know the the right word. Um, uh, of course, uh, maybe there was. A, I mean, it would be good to be able and as bold as it gets to uh, think of something completely new. Um, uh, maybe uh, there was an. An attempt to be also yes ambitious, but also realistic on what it, what it can be done um, in the in the next uh, in the next coming years. Um, there are some points that are uh, very interesting in your in, in what you said. For example, yes, the role of external actors as China. I mean, the role of China is uh, is very is very much is very much uh, um, important in the region and in Europe as well. Um, this. Communication um, will be subject also to a, a review. It's a kind of a um, review uh, mechanism. Um, I think that the first uh, uh, the first uh, um, review will be will happen. I think in 2024. But in any case, it's, it's something open, open to be discussed, open to be improved, and uh, um, and is not something fixed in stone. Um, but is uh, I think it's something that gives also the political support to uh, upshift the gear, to change gear. Um, let's see if uh, uh, a few years down the line it will bring to something completely new. Okay. Uh, I will leave, I mean, we are a, a little bit at the end, so I leave also uh, the floor to others. I see there, there are other hands raised, maybe more questions. I understand uh, a lot of, uh, of what you said, and I think that there is, uh, for all EU watchers at times, there's a bit of a, a frustration of the pace of change in the European institutions, but uh, ultimately I think that that's uh, an inherent uh, uh, quality of, of such a huge machinery. Um, and, you know, we need to appreciate the, the small steps with which things uh, and new ideas and new objectives are launched. Um, I referred in the beginning of my remarks uh, to the fact that uh, prior to the publication of the renewed partnership, there was a lot of effort placed uh, on dialogue with the partner countries by uh, High Representative Borrell and Commissioner Verheli. And I think that that was, um, you know, that was that was an interesting way to explore this partnership, making it from uh, you know, a, a center to periphery to, to a joint effort and to really hearing the partner countries in order to bring uh, their challenges and their ideas for projects that they would want to uh, advance into the communication, into the investment plan. But as you correctly said, you know, Israel is not really there. And ultimately that's because of the very unique role and very unique nature of Israel within the neighborhood. And so, you know, what we're looking for from Europe um, doesn't take the form of investment, uh, but looks uh, uh, more to the form of, of opportunity. Um, and that's what we're hoping that this uh, neighborhood, uh, um, um, you know, uh, approach will, will deliver for us. Uh, so opening of doors and not, uh, and not financing. Um, Thank you. Uh, I see that there is Zarif has got a question. I, I don't see you, but yes. Zarif, can you please... No, you uh, don't see me. Hi. <laughs> you don't see yes. me. I'm, um, I'm a proud Morocco with Jewish heritage, so I'm uh, <laughs> uh, in here as well. as also for the Morocco World News. So I write articles for it. Um, I'm living in Europe, in Europe by the way. 
Uh, but I just wanted to say that I totally agree with you, uh, uh, Mr. Katavaris, uh, because I do think we need a, a total different dynamic and a total different view on how to cooperate with each other. And it's not like we do not need Europe, uh, but it's not like uh, you need it, because I do think that uh, uh, the Arab countries, uh, even though in my view, uh, Morocco is not really an Arab country because it's on the complete west side of uh, North Africa. It's an African country uh, with a, a strong Jewish heritage and also with, an, uh, of course, uh, an Arab uh, culture and uh, being Muslim. But I really do think it's more an equal opportunity what uh, uh, Israel can bring to the other countries because they have a real... Um, sense of what they uh, need also to have a better um, relations with their neighbors uh, and also uh, I do believe that Israel can uh, understand culture wise also better these countries as well uh, and I do believe that Europe perhaps I'm a bit younger than everyone but I do believe Europe is from well let's say the 20th century view and it's also uh, infrastructure and structurized in that way that they like to tell you what to do. I don't say it's a fact, of course. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, wider than that. It is w w uh, broader than that. But I would like really to see a mobilization of the Arab nations with Israel because they, well, yeah, it's, it sounds naive. Uh, well, let me be an idealist, but I, I, we all are connected actually with each other and we, we need to move forward. I do believe Israel can contribute and they have an equal partnership with each other because there is something to gain for both sides. Uh, Israel needs to, something from the Arabs and vice versa, they need something from them. So it's more an equal based what they can contribute and deliver for each other. And also security-wise, uh, Morocco, there is no war between Israel and Morocco, never has been also. I need to be corrected because my family lives in Israel and in, in uh, Morocco. There is no war, there has never been a war. So they actually continue their relations. Uh, therefore, actually, they already had always relations, even though on the background informal. So I, uh, I salute actually every cooperation with, uh, because the, um, also, if you talk about the backside from the terrible, uh, what is happening now in Israel, in Jerusalem, I do believe uh, if they are more engaged with each other, perhaps the Palestinian conflict will resolve. But uh, thank, they need th to Thank you, Terry. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that we are reaching uh, the, uh, almost the end. Uh, I, uh, I think that... Uh, well, I mean, we have one, one more minute to go, but uh, I see here that uh, uh, there is a follow-up on, on my comment from, from Mr. Sobol, so I don't want to, 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 uh, to, to look as if I don't say, uh, give people the reaction. So maybe, Mr. Sobol, you want to say very quickly your, your remark, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, many thanks for the presentations. Uh, greetings from Taipei. Uh, just quick uh, follow-up. Uh, in 2003, when the wider Europe was introduced, already then, a couple of weeks afterwards, policy uh, analysts thought that uh, that's an unrealistic uh, document. Um, and then we had the Treaty of Lisbon, the European External Action Service. We are in 2021. It was supposed to be much more of a geostrategic output. Nothing's there. The same old uh, contradiction between security and democratization, the same technical uh, aspirations without understanding the geopolitical environment. Where are we going to go from here? Because as you've mentioned, and as uh, many others did, there is no change. Like, do we, need, do we see who held the pen? The European Commission officials or the European External Action uh, officials when they actually wrote the new communication? Is there a conflict or bureaucratic uh, conflict between the two institutions that are supposed to guide uh, European Union foreign policy? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that uh, we will leave, uh, unless, uh, uh, unless uh, uh, Luigi or, or Maya, you still want to say something? Or if not, so I will, uh, I will uh, try to, I mean, Never, 
we cannot uh, sum up all that has been said here. I think that we are definitely engaged and, and probably we take the challenge of Michele that uh, we have a time of thinking, of reflection in which we can bring ideas. So I think that we definitely should do that, especially also the private sector or the civil society. Uh, it's not enough just to talk about government, especially in Israel when you don't have governments. So it's better to speak to, uh, to the civil society, but uh, hopefully we'll have one soon. Uh, but uh, I definitely think that, uh, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the region is important. The region is changing. The architecture of the region is changing. Therefore, uh, we should adapt to that, both the Israelis, the Arabs, and the Europeans. So on that note, I thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, I thank MITVIM. I thank the Association for European Integration, the Ever Stiftung, and uh, obviously the, the Chamber of Commerce, which, by the way, uh, will probably have also a uh, uh, next time, a uh, type of meeting. This time, we are trying to invite the ambassadors of the neighboring countries that have relations with Israel, i.e., Morocco, Jordan, Egypt, and maybe the Emirates and Bahrain, to say what they think about that. So, oh, cool. we hope to have such an occasion because now we can gather everybody in Israel, which is something unbelievable and unthinkable few, few, few months ago. So, thank you again, and uh, I hope that Jerusalem is quiet after. The siren were there, and uh, and we all hope for for a, a quiet weekend. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Danny, and to all the participants. Thank you.